What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be brewing a Belgian beer that is definitely not the most popular one out there. Not the most interesting necessarily, but it is one of the most flavorful and enjoyable Belgian beers there are. And that is the Potter's Beer. So Potter's Beer, also known as Trappist Single, is a beer that is really quite hard to find in most cases. Uh, like an authentic Trappist Single, an authentic Potter's Beer, usually is only found at the actual abbeys uh, themselves. Potter's Beer literally means father's beer in Dutch. This means that this is the beer that the monks brew for themselves to actually drink and enjoy. The monks aren't getting trashed off of 10% Belgian quads. They are sitting there enjoying their 5% Potter's beers with a meal, perhaps. The high ABV beers that they sell at the abbeys primarily are to help fund the abbeys and help bring money into the Trappist order. So some examples of a Potter's beer are things like Chimay Doré or the West Vleteren Six. What it is at its core is a Trappist beer with all of the same complexity and intensity of flavors and that's very special abbey yeast that you get out of things like doubles, triples, and quads, but without the massive kick of alcohol on top of it. This makes it a great way to have more than one of these things and really enjoy the special Trappist flavors. So that's what we're doing today. We are brewing up this Trappist single, this Potter's beer, and we're aiming for about a 5% alcohol beer that has pretty much all of the same exact characteristics you would expect out of a triple. These beers are traditionally produced through a method known as party guiling, uh, which is really seldom used outside of the monasteries nowadays. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting technique where you kind of get two beers off of the same mash. So you conduct your mash, and then you have your first runnings, which is the first draw of liquid off of the mash. The first runnings are very high gravity usually. That becomes the strong beer. Then, after that, you add more water to it, you sparge, basically, and the second runnings will come out with a much lower gravity than the first. Once you go through the process of making both of these beers, you have a strong beer and you have a light beer, a small beer, essentially, is what it's called, and that's usually how these are made. So typically, these are going to be coming off of a double, triple, or quad mash, and then you get some of the same characters of those high-gravity beers in this low-gravity beer. The party aisle method is interesting, and it's on my list of things to try out. I'm not going to be doing it here today, though, because this beer, today is something you can very much easily do uh, as its own standalone mash, its own standalone beer. So that's what we're doing today. It's well worth brewing on its own just because it is so interesting. Before we jump into the recipe though, I do want to thank a few organizations for helping make this video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, thank you for providing the ingredients for this batch and uh, go check them out. They're no longer owned by InBev. It's a great place to get your ingredients, your equipment, and also knowledge about home brewing if you're just starting out. They're good guys. They will uh, help you out quite a bit tell them I sent you. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply. They make the system I've been brewing on for the last basically year and a half now, and it is a fantastic system. It's available in both 120 and 240 volt options for your electric brew house. Check them out. They also have a fantastic YouTube channel. I'm sure you know about that. So check all that stuff out. All right, so now let's jump into the recipe. We're aiming for about a four and a half to 5% beer. So uh, not too much grist going into this. We're using eight pounds of franco Belgian Pilsner malt, which is probably one of the best Belgian Pilsner malts you can get. Then on top of that, we're adding only half a pound of aromatic malt. Kind of gives a little bit of extra complexity and uh, a little depth of flavor to the whole thing. Alternatively, you can use biscuit malt or Munich malt, perhaps, um, if you want a slightly different character. But aromatic malt is kind of like Vienna malt on steroids. And then on top of that, we're gonna add one pound of golden candy syrup. So I've been using Simplicity, the, the clear candy sugar, uh, for a while in most of my Belgians, but I wanted to try out this golden candy syrup. It has a slight bit of color to it, 5 SRM, um, and supposedly has a little bit more of a flavor complexity than your typical Simplicity syrup. So I'm hoping that does come through. One of the big pieces of feedback that I got out of my NHC submissions with the Belgians is that they needed more sugar complexity in them. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to achieve here with this one. Alternatively, if you want to darken the beer a bit, you can use something like the D45 candy sugar, uh, which is another option, just going to give you a little bit more darkness in the beer. For our hops, we're going to be using mostly Hallertau and a little bit of Styrian Goldings. So I'm using Hallertau Mittelfuhr. We're going to put one ounce of Hallertau Mittelfuhr in at 60, one ounce at 15, and then we're gonna do a five minute addition with the Styrian Goldings, just one ounce of that as well. For our water profile, now I'm actually gonna be making a bit of a change uh, to the usual, and uh, we're gonna be nixing the sodium bicarbonate addition that I was adding in before. Kinda, someone brought up, yeah, it doesn't really make that much sense that I'm adding sodium bicarbonate and then adjusting my mash pH with lactic acid later. Like, 
Yeah, that makes sense. So <laughs> I mixed it. Uh, so now we are aiming for a slightly different water profile. 75 parts per million of calcium, seven parts per million of magnesium, zero parts per million of sodium, 105 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, you're gonna add two grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, and five grams of calcium chloride to the strike water. This is about eight gallons of uh, distilled water that I'm gonna be using for strike water, and um, that should get you where you need to be. For our yeast in this one, we're gonna go back with what is probably my favorite yeast out of the whole bunch that I've been playing around with, Lalamand Abbey. Uh, it's a dry yeast, and it was entirely responsible for making my triple taste so good. So I'm hoping that that's going to have a similar effect in the Potter's beer. We're going to pitch one packet of Lalamand Abbey Ale yeast. For our mash, uh, we want this to be a well attenuated beer, rather dry at the ends, but not too dry, and still have a massive head on it, as is traditional with all Belgian beers. We're going to start with a 45 minute rest at 148. We're gonna step up to 158 for another 45 minutes. We'll do a mash out at 170 for 15 minutes. In the past, that's created some very nice fermentable worts, light bodied with uh, a good level of head retention. That's what we want. But also having some sugar complexity in there as well. All right, with that all out of the way, let's jump into the brew day. I added eight gallons of spring water to my 10 gallon claw hammer supply 240 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature. I also milled all my grain at this time. Once the water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in and I started to recirculate the mash. After about 10 minutes of this, I took a pH reading and I saw a pH in the mash of 5.75, which is far too high. So to correct this, I added about a cap full of lactic acid to bring it back down to something far more reasonable. Once the mash rested at 148 for 45 minutes, I raised it up to 158 for 45 more minutes, and then I lastly raised it up to the mash out step of 170 and let it rest for 15 minutes at that step. At that time, then I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain again for about 15 minutes. But while I did this, I set the controller to maintain a temperature just below boiling to prevent a boil over while my basket was draining. Once that had finished, I removed the basket and I set the controller to only about 50% power to maintain a good rolling boil. At this time, I added in my 60 minute addition of one ounce of Hallettown Middle Fruit. Now let the boil continue for 45 minutes and then I added my 15 minute hop addition, one ounce more of Hallettown Middle Fruit. I also added a Whirlflock tablet and a little bit of yeast nutrient at this time. 10 minutes later, I added my five minute hop addition, one ounce of Styrian Goldings. Five minutes after that, I ended the boil and then I began to chill everything down to the pitching temperature of about 65 Fahrenheit and I transferred to the fermenter. I took an OG sample using my Anton Par Easy Dense and I saw an original gravity of 1048. At this point, I pitched one packet of Lalamand Abbey into the anvil bucket fermenter and I left it to ferment. Next up, we'll talk about fermentation for this particular beer. The fermentation on this is what makes it what it is. All Belgians are built through the fermentation. The yeast is incredibly important and the selection of it can make a big difference in how your beer tastes at the end of the day, as well as the fermentation temperature, the pitch rate, the level of variation, all of that good stuff, and even the shape of your fermenter. What we are gonna be doing today, though, is pitching one packet of Lalamand Abbey Ale yeast. This is a really simple, easy way to get a significant amount of yeast into your beer to allow it to ferment quickly and uh, healthy as well. So I'm only pitching a single packet of yeast into this rather standard gravity wort, which is actually a pretty significant pitch rate. As a result, having more yeast in the fermentation means that there's definitely a chance that there's gonna be a lower level of esters and a lower level of fermentation character in general. That being said, if you're using a liquid yeast packet, that might give you a slightly different result with more fermentation character because it's a slightly lower pitch rate. In this beer style, you can really get away with a lot of different yeast though. You can either use an Abbey strain like I'm using, or you can use uh, a Golden Strong Ale strain like Y1388, or you can use the 
very famous Ardennes strain, the La Chouffe strain, um, which is another great option for this type of beer. If, however, you're trying to emulate a, uh, a specific Trappist Monastery's Potter's beer, you're gonna probably wanna choose the yeast from that particular monastery if it's available. Basically, you have plenty of different options there. All of these are gonna give you slightly different yeast characteristics. Uh, some might be more estery, some might be more phenolic, some might just be balanced. So, it all depends on what you like in the beer. Secondly, the other thing you're gonna to wanna to do is tweak your fermentation temperature. If you want more esters, ferment it warmer. If you want less, ferment it colder. So, Belgian yeasts are typically gonna give you pear and bubble gum esters, sometimes a little bit of banana, and they're gonna give you spicy clove phenols as well as white pepper, and sometimes a little bit of coriander uh, kind of complexity in there, depending on what temperature you ferment it. Typically though, these Belgians are really gonna to wanna to get nice and warm. So what I like to do for most of my Belgians is start them out at about 68 degrees Fahrenheit off of the pitch. Let it go up to whatever temperature it wants to naturally rise up to during fermentation. It's gonna produce its own heat inside the fermenter to warm itself up. That can actually on its own get the temperature of the beer all the way up into the 80s um, if it goes unsuppressed. Again, with this beer being such a low gravity relative to the other high gravity Trappist styles that I've been making, I do expect there's gonna be less ester activity. So I'm gonna let this thing get as warm as it really wants to and maybe encourage it a little bit. Go up to about 77 degrees, I think, is as high as I'd comfortably kick this. I let my triple go up to 75 with this yeast and it was full of character. So going a little higher than that with a higher pitch rate might make just enough difference. I wouldn't recommend fermenting these under pressure because you're gonna probably end up suppressing the yeast character of the beer itself, uh, which is the primary source of flavor. So it could end up becoming a little less uh, intense in terms of fermentation character than it was designed to be if you ferment under pressure. But that being said, plenty of people still do it. So, I mean, go for it if you feel like it. And also wouldn't recommend using Kvike for this style either. It's gonna be very, very different. It's not a Belgian yeast. It doesn't produce those same esters and phenols. So you're not gonna have the same character at all. It would end up tasting more like a regular old boring pale ale, I think, if you did Kvike. Uh, or more, something more tropical and New World American pale ale style. So what I'm gonna be doing in a nutshell is pitching one packet of Lalamand Abbey yeast into the wort at about 68 Fahrenheit and letting it naturally free rise up to probably about 77 Fahrenheit, no higher. And fermenting it there probably for about five to 10 days. The fermentation should be really quick. It's a low gravity beer, it's a lot of yeast, it's a high fermentation temperature, and um, that should really finish it out pretty fast. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was done within two weeks. And it shouldn't really require any aging, so I should be able to package it up and enjoy it right after that. Uh, so, looking forward to it. I'll catch you guys then. Fermentation was completed probably relatively quickly, but I was actually away from home for a long time, several weeks. And this beer actually ended up sitting in the fermenter for pretty much an entire month before I was able to keg it. It got relatively warm in the fermenter based on my ink bird. Uh, it reached a max of about 78 Fahrenheit just due to the natural heat of the fermentation. So it probably was done in about a week. I saw a final gravity of 1008 when I kegged and that gives us an apparent attenuation of 79%. The beer is called Tiny Monk and it comes in at 5.1% ABV and 31 IBUs. All right, so for the appearance of the beer, it is pouring a lovely, really kind of dark gold color, bordering on orange, uh, very similar color to the triple actually, uh, just a little bit lighter, I think, in my opinion. It's not exactly as clear as the Pilsner I just made, but it's pretty clear. There's a very, very, very subtle haze to it, um, but most of it's just yeast in suspension that's already pretty much lagered out. As far as the head on the beer, it's pouring with a sort of cream colored head. It sticks around for a decent period of time, but doesn't have truly incredible head retention like some of the other Trappist beers that I've made. It does, however, have very good lacing. All in all, it's a pretty pleasing beer to look at. It's kind of nice to see that carbonation coming up through it. Uh, so also very nice to break out the Spencer brewing glass. Uh, I haven't brought that out in a long time and it's kind of a good reminder of you know, a, a fantastic brewery that once was. The Spencer Trappist Ales had to close their doors earlier this year, so this is kind of in memory to them. Spencer was the only Trappist monastery in the United States that produced beer. Now let's move on to aroma. It's a pretty highly aromatic beer. 
with a lot of notes of orange and um, a little bit of honey as well. Just like it's, it's got that wildflower honey, that orange blossom honey almost, um, that it, it really does feel very similar to the triple in terms of aroma. I'm getting a good amount of spice as well. Um, I think it's like a coriander spice, but uh, overall, very aromatic beer, very inviting. Let's accept that invitation and go in for mouthfeel. <sighs> Mouthfeel's light. It's a light bodied beer. Um, it has some edge to it, which I'm kind of surprised about actually. Um, but overall, it, it's very highly drinkable. It's very sessionable. It's definitely not a soft mouthfeel, but it's definitely not hard either. It's just kind of has that edge. Carbonation's definitely there. It's pretty highly carbonated overall. I mean, I kind of do that intentionally for the Belgian styles. They're supposed to be higher carbonation levels, and it definitely affects the mouthfeel as well. It's pretty dry too. It's not exactly Saison dry though, but I think it's as far as dryness, it's where it should be. It's just the mouthfeel's a little bit on the edgy side. So now let's go in for flavor. Mm. It's a good beer, I'll tell you that much. Um, it's a very, very drinkable beer. Coming in at five and a half percent, it really does feel very similarly to the triple. Um, it tastes very similarly to the triple, more specifically. It has those notes of honey and orange and coriander and lavender and chamomile that really were in the triple. One more thing to note though, is this is definitely a lot less sweet than uh, the triple was. And I think the extra 4% alcohol relative from this beer to that beer uh, is definitely a player in the perceived sweetness of that beer. Um, this is relatively similar and definitely feels a lot less sweet. There's one thing though that is a little bit more pronounced in this particular brew versus the triple and that is bubble gum. The beer is pretty heavily yeast driven, uh, which explains a lot of the esters on this one. Specifically to my taste though, this does feel a lot more estery than I would have preferred. Um, and that's just kind of my own palate talking here, but I would have preferred a little bit more of a phenolic taste to this. Something a little bit more clovey, a little bit more spicy, a little bit more peppery. Also, the maltiness on this is, uh, it's very one dimensional. Um, it's definitely good. It's It's got this kind of bready, doughy kind of character, but it's not really, the crisp crackeriness that I think I was envisioning. Maltiness on this is coming through primarily as like a bready doughy character. Um, it's pretty full and rich, I would say, but um, still relatively sessionable and drinkable. This really does feel like a five and a half percent version of the 9% triple. Um, it's very similar in flavor. It's not quite the same thing. It's got a little bit more ester, a little bit less malt character, but it's overall still a pretty good beer. So now let's talk about the potential improvements on this one. First of all, I really think I would have preferred a more phenolic fermentation character in this. So it's very estery. It actually initially was very appley, um, but after about three weeks of conditioning time, it actually turned out to be more of like a pear character over time, which is good. I like the pear a lot more than the apple. I think it was a little bit of acetaldehyde. Um, but anyway, the point is though, this is actually a very estery beer. That bubblegum character is a high ester. Um, it kind of signifies a higher fermentation temperature. There's just really no phenolics in this. I would have preferred a beer that had more phenolics, more clove, more coriander, more spice to it, maybe some peppery kind of uh, notes as well. And I think that's something I would have changed in a rebrew. So maybe adding in a different strain of yeast, perhaps something a little bit more phenolic. Um, or fermenting at a lower temperature between 65 to 68 degrees, perhaps. That would encourage more production of phenols. Secondly, the malt character in this is leaving some things to be desired in, you know, in terms of my personal palate. So both of those improves really are based on my own personal tastes. It has nothing to do with whether or not the beer is good. The beer is good, um, but it all depends on what you like. Do you like estery beers or do you like phenolic beers or do you like balanced beers? I prefer balanced beers. The second thing I would really improve though is that malt character. It's very doughy, it's very bready. It's, it's not exactly what I want out of it. I want more of a crisp, crackery Pilsner character. Uh, Belgian Pilsner malts are definitely notoriously more bready than German Pilsner malt, so perhaps I would add in some German or Bohemian Pilsner malt to get that effect. I think a German Pilsner malt gives you that hay-like, crackery-like, subtly honey-sweet-like character 
that would really, really do uh, wonders for making the base of this beer something completely different. So that's kind of really my recommends on this one. Um, it's kind of nitpicky, it really is. It's, it's a good beer, it's, it's very enjoyable. It's my wife's favorite beer that I've made this year so far. So that's kind of a win too. And at the end of the day, it's still a very highly flavorful and aromatic beer that is a joy to drink. There is something to be said about having a Trappist Ale that has all of the full flavors of a Trappist Triple, but in a lower ABV package. With a beer like this, it's so nice to have such a rich, complex flavor, and you can actually have two or three of them without getting completely, completely trashed, like you would with a 9%, 10%, 11% triple. Overall, though, I'd say this is a great success. I'm very happy with the way this beer turned out. It's definitely one of my favorites in the lineup so far, and I hope you enjoy the video as much as I've enjoyed this beer. If you did, please go ahead, hit that like and comment and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. I really do appreciate the comments though. I, I love reading the comments and talking with people about beer. Uh, it is one of my favorite things to do, one of my favorite parts of this channel. If you wanna support the channel, there's a number of ways to do so. I do recommend checking out the t-shirt store, check out the Patreon if you're inclined, check out the channel memberships if you're inclined, or hit the super thanks button if you feel like it. All of these are great ways to help support me and I do really appreciate all of it. I also have an Amazon store in the description box where you can find a lot of the recommended brewing equipment that I use on the regular and I stand behind. If it's available on Amazon, it's on that list. Go check it out if you're interested. Please feel free to also follow me on Facebook and Instagram at The Apartment Brewer if you want some more frequent content besides YouTube. Either way, guys, I really appreciate you sticking around to the end. It means a lot to me. So until the next one, cheers.